All right, Don, so we're doing 14.2 here at the age of the railroads. So we decided to throw this in with the unit with the Native Americans and the Pocatello Prairie because of how central the railroad industry was in the expansion of the West. Okay, so our objective here is to learn about the dominance of the railroad industry. I mean, this is very much the most important industry in the United States going into the late 1800s. And you know, the developments that helped America industrialize and expand the way that it did during this time period. So the first thing we're going to talk about, and we mentioned it last lecture, which runs from Missouri all the way out to Sacramento, California, um, where the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads met up at Promontory Point right outside, Salt, just north of Salt Lake City in Utah uh, to connect the railroad, which now allows you to go from one coast all the way over to the other. So you could actually stretch from the uh, Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean via the railroad. And what this will do is this will connect the western markets with the eastern markets and uh, make it much more profitable for trade and um, transportation. The trip only took 10 days as opposed to something that could take months or weeks going by boat or going by land and other routes. This really speeds up the way America can trade and commerce. Yeah, and we've talked about the idea of the transcontinental railroad before. If you remember, following the war against Mexico and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, we then purchased the Gaston Purchase in 1853. And what that will do is that will allow another railroad later on, the Southern Pacific Railroad, to stretch all the way um, to the West Coast in the South. And so this idea of a transcontinental railroad or a railroad that stretches all the way to the Pacific have been uh, talked about and discussed for a long time. This was actually worked on during the Civil War and finished just a few years after the Civil War. Um, so it might surprise you to learn that it happened that long ago. But with this expansion and railroads stretching from one ocean to the other, we have an issue with times. Uh, it was never a huge deal. Obviously, everyone sort of kept their own local or regional time and it wasn't that big of an issue because the times were never too far off. They would go by the angle of the sun and figure it out. But now with trains leaving at specific times to either transport people or to ship goods, you need to know exactly what time it is, when the train will be arriving, and when the train will be leaving, so that way you're on time for things. So what they did is the United States of America created four time zones. And as you know, we're in the Eastern time zone today, and the time zones have changed a bit. We've also added some for Alaska and Hawaii, and they've moved around a little bit, but the idea was now the train schedules will actually be on time, and everyone will know when they're coming and going, uh, and so forth. Okay, so there's a couple of uh, big things happen. Right? We've talked about this, the expansion, right? This allows towns to grow up, especially in the West, new markets in the West, that allows farmers to get their goods to big cities, especially like Chicago, Omaha, became big meatpacking cities, big uh, kind of farm industry cities where they process a lot of food. It opened up all of those markets. Uh, you had the growth of the big cities that became railroad hubs, right, and the continental trade back and forth, but it also opened the door to a lot of corruption, a lot of oppression, right, the, the companies weren't really run especially ethically, and there wasn't really a lot of government regulation over those. And what happens in the big business and the railroad boom is, like Mr. Nelsky mentioned, because there's not a lot of government regulation, right, the government actually watching over these railroad companies to make sure what they're doing is fair and on the up and up and, and uh, legal, what happens is you have a lot of big businessmen taking advantage of not only their situation, but also the people who work for them. One example of that is Pullman, Illinois, was basically a railroad town built by George Pullman, who owned the railroad, and everyone lived in the houses or apartments that he created. They bought his goods, they bought his clothing, and he had a monopoly on the entire town, and he controlled their wages and their work hours. So all of their freedom was really taken away from them in order to maximize his profit along the way. 
Uh, and you can look at this cartoon criticizing pulmonary. He has this worker in this uh, vice where he has the low wages and he, as he continually lowered their rent, I mean, lowered their wages as he continually raised their rent, right? Because he, he owns the houses they all live in, right? He owns the stores they buy their goods in, right? So he was making tons of money off of his employees. Yeah, and eventually, which we'll talk about later, that will lead to, uh, unsurprisingly, a strike from the workers at the Pullman factory. But it wasn't just big businessmen taking advantage of their workers. It was also taking advantage of the connections they had in government. And none is more clear than the Craig Mobier scandal of the 1860s and 70s. And this is when the Union Pacific Railroad, one of the two railroad companies that built, uh, it's the railroad company that started in Missouri and built west for the Transcontinental Railroad. And what they did is they basically became friendly with different people in Congress and they were given <coughs> control over building the railroad. Um, they were given uh, special land grants. They were given subsidies for their railroad from the government, money from the government to help them build the railroad. They were charging exorbitant prices that the government would then pay them back. And so they were getting rich off of it, and then they were giving kickbacks or a little, a little bit of money back to the congressmen in order to keep everything hush-hush. And eventually that was exposed, and people began to uh, have a sharper eye on not only the railroad companies and big business, but also the government employees who could potentially profit off of their scandals. Yeah, if Bernie Sanders was Bernie Sanders was around in the 1880s, he would be talking about the evils of the railroad industry, not the evils of the banking industry. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, so we talked about how uh, railroads were the main source of transportation. These companies had a real monopoly on quick and efficient movement. So they could basically charge whatever they wanted and they charged exorbitant rates to these rural farmers that depended on the railroads to get their market to town. Because the only way to get their goods to market, they could charge them pretty much whatever they wanted because they had no other choice. Right? So they would kind of, farmers especially, really resented the way railroads treated them because they basically kind of, you know, took advantage of them. Yeah, and I mean, you can imagine if you're a farmer uh, out west in Kansas and your farm is a few miles from the local railroad stop and they're charging ridiculous prices. Well, if you have 3,000 pounds of wheat you need to ship east, you don't have a choice. You have to pay those railroad prices. It's either that or you just work for all of this wheat and you have nothing to do with it. So it's basically you take little to no profit or go hugely into debt. And of course the farmers chose little to no profit. But eventually what happens is these railroad rates frustrate everyone. And we talked about uh, populism in the last chapter and how that was one of the big issues for the populist was that railroads and big business were taking advantage of them. Well eventually states, like we mentioned last lecture, began to listen to these populist demands. And they set up uh, actual commissions within the states to keep track of the railroad rates, to analyze them, to jot down notes about them, but not really do much of anything about it. Until the state of Illinois gave their commission the power to actually force the railroads to lower their rates. And that's what brings us to the Supreme Court case of 1877, Munn versus Illinois. Okay, so in Mongers, Illinois, the Supreme Court actually gives states the power to tell railroads what they can and cannot charge for their usage, right? Which is a big deal. It's what the farmers and the people really wanted, but they couldn't be exploited anymore. However, it actually gets reversed partly because of the interstate commerce. Basically, they were saying uh, state can't regulate the trade between two different states, right? So the government of the Interstate Commerce Act which is meant for the federal government to regulate railroad prices. But remember how corrupt it was and how much money the railroad industry was throwing around. The Interstate Commerce Act wasn't necessarily really enforced all that well, really until the Roosevelt administration. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind when we think about, you know, go, go all the way back and think about the precedents the Supreme Court has set throughout American history. This one be Illinois allowing a state to control a railroad that runs through three states, obviously, for many, could be viewed as unconstitutional. If we think back to the Gibbons v. Ogden case um, in the 18, uh, 1824, and 
We think about how the federal government and the Marshall Court said if it's interstate commerce, only the federal government can control it, not state governments. And later, nine years after this, like Mr. Minelsky mentioned, in the Wabash case, the Supreme Court realizes that this one decision has flown right in the face of Gibbons v. Ogden, and actually the states cannot control the railroad. And what will eventually happen is, like Mr. Minelsky mentioned, the Interstate Commerce Act is passed, the federal government doesn't pay attention, and then the panic of 1893 sets in, sending the economy into a tailspin, which is something that we spoke about last section uh, with the rise of the populist movement and uh, the arguments for bimetallism and for the silver to back the dollar. Basically, in 1893, the railroad industry had expanded so much, so quickly, and had taken on so much debt and speculation doing that, basically people betting in the stock market, that the railroads do what? And they stopped doing as well, and then all of that collapsed. They couldn't pay their debts, and the banking industry and all these other industries tied to the railroad industry collapsed when the, some of the worst railroads did. And similar to 2008 financial crisis, many financial crises start with a bubble where things are worth more than they should be, and then when that bubble pops, it just drags the rest of the economy down. Absolutely. And next we're going to talk about, we're going to move on and talk about inventions and the rise of big business tycoons during this time period. So it, this is going to flow right into that lecture. Anything else? All right, if you have any questions, make sure to ask Mr. T-shirt.